Um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to join you today and uh, sort of elaborate a little bit on, on who I am and where I uh, come from. Uh, I, I am a historian. I describe myself usually as a historian of American politics, business, and capitalism. Uh, I published the first book uh, that Donna mentioned called Lobbying America in 2013. Uh, that was a book about the political mobilization of large industrial corporations and their lobbyists in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then last spring, I published The Land of Enterprise, which surveys the long-term connections between uh, business and major currents in American history, uh, quite broad from settlement and slavery to continental expansion, war, technological changes, as well as political culture. All of that is to say that I am fundamentally interested in historical links between business and economic development on one hand and questions of American society and public life on the other. And at the moment, I am at work in these sort of early stages of a new book project uh, that addresses those interests. In particular, this is a, a book that will be about the sort of history of small business uh, and its place in American life particularly in the final decades of the 20th century, so really from the 1970s forward. The history that I'm looking to share with you today and, and then discuss with you after my, my brief uh, presentation here relates to some of the questions that animate my research. Specifically, I'm interested in how the American public broadly understood the promise, the potential, and the peril of small business ownership across time, and particularly how those views shape vital questions about work, about opportunity, about economic development, as well as about the role of the state. Now I've titled my talk uh, this afternoon, the, the Populist Paradox, to reflect what I think is the peculiar place of small business, and especially that sort of popular mythology surrounding po small business, in contemporary politics. So maybe let me, let me try to explain what I mean. In many ways, uh, owning a small business is seen as the sort of ultimate display of rugged individualism, right? It's, the, it's the, this notion of self-reliance, risk-taking, uh, the embodiment of a certain set of American values that hearken all the way back to Thomas Jefferson and hailing the virtues of, of independent yeoman farmers at the time of the founding. And I think this sort of way of seeing small business is reflected in the place of small business within our political discussions and our political discourse. That is to say, to defend and to promote small business is to uh, both kind of affirm those values of independence and on the flip side to challenge uh, and limit the power of the state, of big government, uh, on issues that range from regulation to taxation to employment law and others. What's interesting to me as a historian is, in fact, how, how novel and dis historically distinctive this polit political dynamic actually is. And the reason is that for much of American history, the owners of small businesses really didn't see big government as their fundamental antagonist. Rather, they saw themselves in contradistinction to big business. So for much of American business history, uh, the idea of a, of a robust, of an active, of a regulatory, or even an interventionist state was, for many small business owners, a vital bulwark against unfair and anti-competitive behavior from large corporations. Now, the concept of small business itself has a history. Um, it dates really to the latter decades of the 19th century. That's not because there were no small businesses before the late 19th century. In, in fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. It's pretty much that before the mid to late 19th century, every business was a small business. Uh, there were certainly exceptions, uh, moments of sort of large concentrations of economic power. You might think of things like the heavily capitalized joint stock companies of the colonial period or large financial institutions, the sort of public-private uh, constitution like the first and second banks of the United States during the antebellum years. 
But even those large economic entities lacked the structural complexity, the managerial hierarchies, and the scope of what comes to be known as big business in the years after the United States Civil War. It's only by the late 19th century that we identify historically something that can clearly be discerned as big business. And so we really don't speak of small business as a category until there is something to contrast it with. And as I say, that happens in the late 19th century when increasingly large, integrated, multi-unit, hierarchically organized and managed corporations begin to emerge. The first big businesses were the railroads uh, of, the 19, of the 1850s and 1860s, which are then joined by the 1870s and 1880s by giant steel manufacturers, oil refiners, chemical plants, and closer to home, things like mass producers of cigarettes and tobacco products, for example. Now, by 1900, big business had merged, expanded, spread, creating monopolies and oligopolies in many fields, all while employing vast numbers of workers and controlling unprecedented sums of capital. And as big business expanded, a popular pushback also developed. Most famously, the pushback against the new role of big businesses in society is often linked with uh, agricultural communities, farmers, particularly people like those who formed the Populist Party in the 1890s, nominating William Jennings Bryan for president in, president in uh, 1896. This pushback also galvanized organized labor, leading to protracted strikes and the modern labor movement. In a related vein, opposition to big business spurred radicalism, socialism, communism, uh, as well as a more liberal progressive tradition uh, focused on antitrust. We associate with politicians like Theodore Roosevelt or William Taft, Woodrow Wilson, or legal scholars like Louis Brandeis. But one of the things that is particularly significant about this pushback against big business, which maybe doesn't register quite as strongly in our collective memory, came from small business owners themselves. And I'll give you a few examples of how this sort of small business oriented pushback to big business came about. Uh, in the 1870s, to take one example, state governments started to face increased pressure from small scale shippers and producers uh, who objected to things like the preferential rates that large railroad companies were offering to bulk shippers and large manufacturers. Uh, this pressure, which was particularly prominent in agricultural regions of the Midwest, led to the creation of state-level regulatory agencies that eventually formed the basis for federal regulatory policy and the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission by 1887. In the same decades that this sort of push toward regulation was emerging, a, a, a parallel push toward opposition to monopolies themselves was growing. Uh, likewise, this was propelled largely by the proprietors of small companies. In 1890, the Ohio Senator Republican John Sherman sponsored federal legislation that was aimed at protecting free competition. And it did so by criminalizing all corporate consolidations that restrained trade or commerce. This was the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, which has been the basis of American antitrust law ever since. And perhaps maybe most famously, uh, in the early 1900s, the muckraking journalist Ida Tarbell uh, came to national attention, exposing the anti-competitive behavior of Standard Oil Company's John Rockefeller, helping to sort of spark and drive a public fervor that eventually led the Roosevelt and Taft administrations to prosecute Standard Oil under the Sherman Act. What's frequently forgotten or overlooked in the story of that antitrust movement and, and the role of, of, of Ida Tarbell's history in particular is that Tarbell achieved such public fame by denouncing Rockefeller's monopoly not for its deleterious effects on consumers, the people who were purchasing the petroleum and oil products, but for the effect that the Rockefeller monopoly had on small and independent refiners, including, not coincidentally, Tarbell's father, 
the people that Rockefeller was running out of business. So the point of some of those historical examples is to s suggest that small business owners played an important role uh, in the building of the regulatory state and the antitrust legal tradition. They also played an important, if far less successful in the long term, role in fueling opposition to the expansion of chain-based retailing. Now, chain stores, as we know them today, were the sort of organizational descendants of the first big businesses. The first big businesses that emerged in railroading and manufacturing eventually sort of led their structures and their uh, managerial innovations to retailing. And what happens in the latter decades of the 19th century was that retailers, such as most famously the, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, the A&P, or F.W. Woolworths, adopted some of these managerial techniques from large firms, large corporations, and applied their management skills, their management structures, their logistical techniques, borrowing all of these things from railroads and industrialists, and applying them to the, uh, the retailing business. They reduced uh, their costs, for example, by tightly coordinating their logistics. They took control of their distribution channels. They used their market power in particular to secure preferential deals from their suppliers. And then they outcompeted their competitors by offering lower prices. Now, by the 19 teens and 1920s, a powerful backlash against those chains had begun to coalesce. And at the helm of that backlash were, was a movement of small proprietors. These are the people, the very stores, the mom and pop stores of Main Street USA, that the chain stores were pushing out of business. Now the anti-chain movement developed a number of strategies to push back against the power of chain stores, all of which were predicated on using the power of government and the law to thwart the predations of big business. The fundamental issue from the perspective of small shop owners was that manufacturers and suppliers gave bulk discounts to large retailers. As a result, what, emoved, what emerged was a movement pushing for fair trade laws. And the fair trade laws of the time were aimed at uh, primarily allowing manufacturers to fix prices at a higher level preventing large retailers from getting specialized discounts that would allow them to undercut smaller stores. Another aspect of the anti-chain movement involved using the tax code explicitly to level the playing field. Uh, by 1927, Maryland, the state of Maryland, passed a law that prohibited uh, chain stores from expanding into the state and imposed a progressive income tax uh, on chains not based on their total income or total uh, profits, but rather on the number of stores they operated. This was challenged in court, but in 1931 the Supreme Court upheld the laws and agreed that taxing chain stores on a different basis from non-chain stores was in fact legally okay uh, on the grounds that by virtue of their market power, chain stores represented a qualitatively different entity uh, than, than smaller stores, and thus having a different tax code for them didn't amount to some sort of tax discrimination. Probably the most important moment in the history of, of the sort of small business campaign against big retailers came in the midst of the Great Depression. And it was the fruit of efforts by a, a politician, a, a staunchly populist Democrat from Texas uh, named Wright Patman. Patman was the son of poor tenant farmers uh, from rural Texas. He was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1928. And he made his name uh, from the 1930s, really on until his death in the 1970s, as the defender, usually called a fiery defender, uh, of small companies and small economic interests in the face of large and consolidated, often monopolistic forces. He likewise denounced the Eastern banking establishment, industrialists, and particularly by the 1930s, chain stores. In 1936, Patman successfully shepherded through Congress a bill, 
uh, that had been proposed and lobbied for by wholesale grocers, known as the Robinson-Patman Act. It was Robinson uh, came from the, the role played by a Arkansas senator named Joseph uh, Robinson, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, as the co-sponsor. The Robinson-Patman Act then passes in 1937 and severely limits those bulk discounts that large chain stores could receive from their suppliers and then pass on to consumers. The hope of this law was that Patman could eliminate unfair discounts, uh, but both, both the, the hope was that the manufacturers would just charge the same exact price to both a large retailer and a smaller retailer, and therefore all of the same discounts would be available to all the buyers, whether they were buying from big chain stores or small local groceries, um, preserving the discounts to the consumers but preventing that sort of price competition that was benefiting the big stores at the expense of the small stores. Again, keeping sort of a benefit for consumers while striking a blow against concentrated wealth and privilege. Small business populists like Wright Patman considered this law a big victory. They hailed it uh, with clearly some exaggeration, as the Magna Carta of small business. In fact, they had even hoped that the law would go further. What they had wanted to do to protect these small stores uh, was to completely eliminate any sort of discounts and price discriminations. In order to kind of negotiate the, the bill through Congress, uh, they had actually had to make some concessions. And they ultimately conceded that manufacturers could still offer reasonable price discounts uh, they just couldn't offer unfair price discounts to different types of retailers. Now the distinction between reasonable discounts and unfair discounts was not something they could specify in the law, of course, and that distinction itself fell to the Federal Trade Commission for arbitration. And it's largely for that reason that most historians consider the, right, uh, the Robinson-Patman Act not as the beginning of a sort of sustained anti-chain movement, but really as the end of a policy regime that protected small businesses or deployed antitrust law to weaken large economic interests. I would add that even before it passed, many policymakers were skeptical uh, that this law could actually do anything to redress the balance between big chain stores and small operations. And that wasn't simply coming from sort of conservatives or intensely pro-business uh, political, po political uh, sides. It was in fact coming from uh, people who might politically be aligned with the interests of small proprietors uh, and so forth. Uh, and who really didn't see much of a problem in you know, deploying the, the, law, the, the force of the, of the law and the state to level the economic playing field. Chief among these skeptics was Franklin Roosevelt himself, uh, who did sign the law, but uh, was skeptical that it would actually work. He, he naturally had no problem with the uh, philosophical idea of using the power of the state to limit the operations of enterprise uh, if he thought that that was in the public interest. But he did worry that this bill could thwart economic recovery, uh, that it could drive up prices uh, or allow failing businesses to kind of stumble on uh, for too long. So he signed it with some reluctance. Even more populist Democrats, particularly those with uh, very active agrarian rural constituencies, also were skeptical of the bill. Um, many of them sort of appreciated its politics, right? The appeal of uh, standing up for the small shops and against those sort of entrenched economic interests, but they worried that really, as far as chain stores and the modern economy were concerned, uh, the horse was pretty much out of the barn. Uh, there's a quote from one Democratic senator from Kentucky uh, who said, this is the quote, there is, there is no way by legislation to afford protection to the less fortunate or less efficient merchant. We cannot prevent efficiency, he said. We cannot stop progress. So already by the 1930s, you see this notion that uh, economic efficiency and economic progress are tied up in the idea that larger, more efficient economic organizations will inherently kind of outcompete and triumph over smaller ones, no matter 
the sort of optics and politics involved. So a combination of factors ultimately spelled the end of Wright Patman's brand of small business populism. Uh, the New Deal of the 1930s redefined the modern state, the mobilization of World War II, not to mention the resounding success of the war, helped make the public case for big institutions, big industry, big agencies, big scales of production and destruction. And by the post-war years, by the 1950s and 1960s, an ethic of bigness really predominated in academic debates over the economy. It predominated within the business community and largely predominated within national politics. Big corporations with big research grants from big government agencies worked with big universities to bring you modern life, from pharmaceuticals to aerospace, and computers to communications, ultimately the internet. Now by the latter years of his life, Wright Patman continued to rail against concentrated economic interests. There were times when he joined forces, at least rhetorically, with consumer rights advocates, particularly groups led by, uh, by Ralph Nader, uh, one of his whose issues was the, the issue of interlocking directorates of corporate boards of directors. Patman also weighed in uh, against banking policies that preyed on, on more vulnerable would-be uh, borrowers. And yet by the time he died in 1976, Patman's brand of populist politics that sort of linked small business interests with consumers, all of which was situated in opposition to big businesses and monopolies, and relied inherently on regulation from the government, all this was decidedly in decline. Now, I think what happens over the course of the post-war period was that the most active and vocal proponents of small business had increasingly come to side with the most active and vocal proponents of big business and had very little interest in allying themselves with critics of large capitalist institutions. I can give you just one example of this sort of reshuffling of political allegiances. Uh, in 1980, there was an event organized by a group of uh, consumer advocates, uh, environmental groups, labor unions, and religious organizations, uh, teaming up with people associated with Nader, but much bigger than that circuit. Uh, and it was a day designed to raise public awareness and overtly criticize the power of large corporations in American society. It was modeled after Earth Day. Uh, they called it Big Business Day. And the organizers of this event in 1980 hoped that this would reinvigorate sort of social movement politics uh, and sort of kickstart a broad-based populist pushback against corporate power. This is, I think of it sort of as a Bernie Sanders campaign of on la lettre. Now one of this organization's uh, organizers tried explicitly to tap into that historic animosity between small business and large business and to drum up support for Big Business Day within the small business community. He wrote this open letter, he targeted sort of mailers to a variety of business organizations and small business groups and he proclaimed that as far as the organizers of this event were concerned, small business was an essential constituency of the anti-big business movement. He argued that you know, small businesses should be on the side of the environmental movement, of the labor movement, of the consumer movement, uh, because they likewise faced discrimination or hardship because of the power of large corporations. Big business, he said, run, ran roughshod over small business owners when it abused its market power, when it used its political clout, for example, to get preferential tax credits or subsidies or contracts or loans. The natural alliance, according to the organizations, according to the Big Business Day vision, was between small business owners and the movement of sort of liberal reform groups. What's critical about that story is that the business community was having none of it. Right? The small business community wanted nothing to do whatsoever with this day of protest. No small business organizations joined forces with Big Business Day in 1980. 
At the same time, they did quite the opposite. There was a pushback to the pushback, if you will, uh, and organizations like the United States Chamber of Commerce uh, attracted a lot of support from small businesses when they sponsored counter protests that sort of promoted the, the virtues of free enterprise and solidarity and common purpose among businesses of all sizes. So in the same day that the liberal reform organizations were having their, their big business day, the Chamber of Commerce and several other organizations declared, uh, I believe they called it Growth Day, uh, to proclaim the, the virtues of all business, big and small, on the American economy. So by the late 1970s and into the 1980s, the loudest voices and the most well-connected mouthpieces of the small business community had decidedly taken the side of big business. They saw the government, both the state and federal governments, not as the protector of markets or the guarantors of free competition or fair competition, but rather as an obstacle to free enterprise itself. At the same time, in the late 1970s and into the early 1980s, the social status and the political esteem of small business owners experienced a remarkable resurgence. And it may be a little hard to wrap our heads around what I mean by that since we're so used to thinking of, big, of small business as the kind of embodiment of American virtue and uh, rugged individualism way back to Jefferson and so forth. But during the post-war years, there was a lot of sort of institutional neglect of the interests of small businesses. And that appeared to get rectified or changed um, by the late 70s and into the 1980s. Uh, to take a couple of measures of this, trade associations that were dedicated to small business issues dramatically increased their membership and their political clout uh, by the 1980s. One classic example would be the, the National Federation of Independent Business, um, one of the most prominent political organizers around issues related to small business, had, had been around since the 1940s, but it's kind of trajectory by the 1980s took it to a whole different level of political activism, uh, direct and indirect lobbying, um, and sort of a na more of a national appeal. At the same time, organizations like the US Chamber of Commerce also kind of pivoted towards small business interests. Earlier in the post-war period, the Chamber of Commerce, despite its name and its sort of reputation as the uh, place to go if you're a Main Street USA business, had really been focused on on, on very large corporations. By the 1970s and 80s, it was opening up new divisions and task forces, uh, all to advocate for the interests of small business. Now that's just the lobbying side, right? There's also uh, an explosion of academic research and interest in entrepreneurship, in business ownership. Uh, in 1970, to give you one small example, uh, there were only eight American universities that offered a course in starting a new business. Uh, by 1980, 137 universities offered a course in starting a new business. Magazines and journals devoted to entrepreneurship also proliferated. And by the mid-1980s, commentators were regularly bragging that they were just living in the era of the entrepreneur. This is uh, a new attention that we're receiving. One of them said, this is the quote, after years of neglect, those who start and manage their own businesses are viewed as popular heroes. And this really brings us to the populist paradox at the heart of this story. In the last several decades, small business has become a hero in the American political imagination. And that is exactly in the historical moment when the macro economy has become increasingly dominated by larger and larger firms that garner more and more market share from Walmart to ExxonMobil to Amazon to Facebook. In fact, in many tellings, small business is the savior of the modern economy. It's the backbone of growth, the job creators, the lifeblood of local community, the thing that will pull us through. And yet this populist politics that drove small business activism in the uh, early part of, business, of this history has really been redirected. The most vocal advocates of small business are also the most vocal advocates of the policies that allow large firms to grow concentrated. They allow large banks to merge, large retailers to drive out small ones. The policy preferences, in other words, of big and small companies have intersected in a generalized antagonism toward regulation, toward taxation, toward other types of economic involvement 
even antitrust enforcement. This is a historical departure, I think, and this is one that, I, that will have important consequences uh, for business owners and for our economic future in the years ahead. 